My name is Martin Tanner, and I'm here because for the last 33 years, I've been involved in studying and researching near-death experiences. I co-founded the Utah chapter of the International Association for Near-Death Studies in 1990, and I'm currently the vice president of the International Parent Organization, IONS. And so that's kind of what I do for fun and for research. I also have a radio talk show host that I do over the weekends on KSO Radio. And during the week, I work at a law office. I went to law school and graduated in 1984, practiced law for quite some time, mostly do business consulting these days. I became interested in near-death experiences initially when I read because somebody suggested that I read it, the very first book ever written on the subject, which is called Life After Life by Raymond Moody, PhD, MD, pretty smart guy. And in there, he cataloged dozens of experiences of people who had gone to the other side and come back. And he wrote his book in 1976. It's still out there. It has sold well over 30 million copies. It's been very popular. But I looked at those and, and they sort of rang true to me, but I wanted to do my due diligence and make sure that they were really real, that this wasn't just a kind of an interesting book that someone had made up. And I also wanted to look at the alternatives to see if maybe these were dreams or hallucinations or you know somebody was delusional or had a mental issue or psychiatric problem. And so I tried to find out that what the truth was. And in connection with my radio show at the time, I was able to track down Raymond Moody and have him in studio and talk to him about the alternatives, which he outlines in his book. You know, is this mental illness? Are these dreams? Are these hallucinations? So that's sort of my early intro into the genre. And from there, I started to interview people who I found who firsthand, you know, had been through this. One of the very first ones was a little girl who had been at a birthday party. She was about seven and she got pushed into the deep end by some kids running by her while she was standing on the edge and went to the bottom and the pool was so busy that nobody noticed her. And that was when she had first come into the pool. She was on the bottom for about 20 minutes, give or take a few. And she came back and had this amazing story to tell her agnostic uh, pediatrician who had saved her, who's currently a, a good friend of mine since all this happened, we've kept in touch over the years, asked this little girl when the nurses ran in and said, Dr. Morse, Dr. Morse, she woke up and he went in and interviewed her to find out what had happened. How are you? You know, can you count one, two, three, these little cognitive Passed and, and she passed all those and seemed fine, which was astounding to him. And he said, so what happened to you? And he expected to hear the story about how she drowned. And then instead, she said, oh, you mean when I went to heaven and saw God and sat on Jesus' lap? You know, and he thought, oh, that's interesting because he was kind of an agnostic Jewish guy. So he didn't have much experience with Jesus. And from there, he was very intrigued. And he and I talked and I ultimately interviewed this little girl and the doctor and her parents. So sort of my first introduction to the area. I would be happy to. Different researchers have come up with different elements that are part of near-death experiences or can be. And no one has them all, but everyone has a few or else it wouldn't be a near-death experience. And the analogy that I give is, if you interview somebody who claims to have taken a vacation to Portugal, you know, you could ask them a series of questions and sort of verify that they really had been to Portugal, at least if you know how to ask the questions correctly. But no two people who went there are going to tell you the same story because they will probably see different things there or go to different places or have a slightly different experience. But going back to near-death experiences, if you want to go into a lot of detail, 
usually, but not always, they happen when somebody has some kind of a severe trauma. So that would be the first element, some kind of near death, hence the title, kind of a trauma either from an accident or an overdose or any traumatic thing. Next, they often find themselves either on an operating table or in some other context, and they will hear kind of a vibration or ringing or sound in their ears. They call it various things. And it, that is apparently the sound that's heard when your spirit or whatever you'd like to call it leaves your body, which it typically does for most people through the crown of your head. At least that's the way many of them describe it. So that would be the third element that the near-death episode, the ringing in your ears, and then leaving your body. Next element is you often are above your body looking down and seeing it. And some people find that really troubling. Some people think it's kind of cool. Others say it's detached. They had no interest in it at all. And from there, the direction that near-death experiences go, there's great variety there. Some people have kind of negative experiences where they go off into a dark place and eventually find their way out one way or another, usually by trying to talk to God or pray. Other people find a light or a tunnel. That would be the vast majority of them. They just feel impressed to go up through a tunnel uh, towards this light at the end of the tunnel. And other people just sort of bypass all that and find themselves somewhere on the other side. I've interviewed another, a number of people who have been with relatives or friends. One of the more interesting recent ones was a guy named Ted Whiting in Salt Lake City suburbs who his father had been murdered when he was young. And, and he found himself talking to his father and said, gee, I wish... You'd been around more when I was young. And he said, yeah, but, you know, when you get murdered, it's kind of hard to do that. And Ted says, yeah, how, how was that? It sounds horrible to be drowned because the way they killed his father was they wrapped him in a fishing net and tied duct tape around his arms and ankles so he, he couldn't really get out and put a couple of bricks in the fishing net and tossed him in a lake and kind of gruesome along with his dog. And so... Ted's asking his dad, gee, that just sounds like such a horrible way to die. And his dad said, well, you know, the first time you breathe that water in, it really doesn't feel so good. But after that, it's really not so bad, you know. So they're having this kind of surreal dis discussion about that. And then they get into more serious things like, Ted, you're not supposed to be here. You got to go back. So and then he goes back. And so that was about the extent of Ted's experience. Other people have more elaborate ones. They might meet deity on the other side. They might be given a choice. They might have great ver variety of, of experiences. One of the typical things that happens for adults is they will often either at the end of the tunnel or before they, they go, have some kind of a life review. And they describe it as in 3D panorama, seeing every single instant in their life from start to finish, from their birth till the very instant they're in that position. And you ask them, well, wait a minute, that's as old as you are. How could you go through all that during the few minutes you were on the other side? They say time is something different over there. It doesn't happen the way it is here. And so that's another element of near-death experiences. Uh, time is different. Some say it doesn't exist. Some say it's different. You can meet relatives or, or friends. I've talked to a few people who didn't have too many friends because they had a difficult personality and they met their pet that had died, you know, their dog that had died, which was a really cool thing for him. Most, after they have this life's review, have this intense feeling that now they understand more about life. They're not just viewing it, they are emotionally completely immersed in it. 
they can see how every one of their actions affected other people every day and how that in turn affected other people and the way they treated others. That's a little abstract. A good example was a lady named Angie Benamore, who I spoke with a number of times. She currently lives in Alaska. And when she was a little girl, she had been asked by her mother to come to a convalescent home. You know, we would call it an assisted living center now, I suppose. And her mother had asked her to come because she had a really sweet voice. And she sang several songs for these elderly people who were homebound or sitting in wheelchairs. And she had no clue when she was five, this was anything more than just some ordinary event. But as she relived it through her near-death experience, she saw the intense emotions and impact that this had on the other people who were sitting around listening to her sing. And it just caused great love and joy. And she realized at that point, and this is something that's also a common element from people who experience this, sometimes the smallest little things that you might do are the most important. Things like a smile, going out of your way to help someone in some small way. It's, it's not the how big your house is, that you know how much money you make, what your job's like. It's can you help somebody? Have you done something that would really make an impression? Because the gist of what a lot of people say is this is a great big ripple in a lake. The ripples that you cause either for good or evil go out like throwing a rock into a lake and you see those and they could be for good or evil. And so if you choose the good ones, even the small little unnoticed ones that they can have a massive impact. So going on from there, some people have a direct experience with who they describe as God or Jesus. Some who are not religious at all say, I know this was the creator or this was the source of everything, you know, you hear all these descriptions, but they they kind of describe the same being in different words. And the number one way that he is described is intense love. One guy I knew who'd had a really troubled life. As a matter of fact, he joined the army to go to Vietnam so he could shoot people without being in trouble and going to jail. I, I mean, he was just angry because some of his friends had been killed when he was younger. And he he said the encounter that he had in his near-death experience when he was shot up in Vietnam was life-altering for him. He said, when I was a little kid, I knew that my parents loved me. I could feel their love, but this love that I experienced from God was immense, almost overwhelming, hundreds of times, thousands of times, millions of times more intense and overwhelming and deep and real than the kind of love that he had experienced from his parents. He said, I love my parents. It's just they just didn't have that capability. And from there, when people come back, they have this desire, which would be another element to love other people sort of in the same way that they felt loved up there to try to do their best to come close to what that was like. And the other thing is to learn. People have this intense desire to learn. So they often will go back to school or change careers or start reading books on all kinds of different subjects, including their death experiences now that they're available. So that's sort of the rough outline of, of the different elements that people might find. There are others that happen. Some people go and see other locations off the planet. Some see medical procedures that are performed upon them. There are a number of, of elements, but most of those are not frequent. When I first started to interview people, nobody could have made them up. They didn't know enough about them. And so if somebody was telling you something, you either instantly knew they were lying or telling the truth because they either got it all wrong or they got it all correct. And now it's a little bit different because there's so many near-death experiences that are out there. You have to be a little bit careful. There are some people that seek notoriety 
the ways that you can tell, and, and so some of the questions that I tend to ask people are, how do you know this was real? And people who are, you know, kind of faking it either won't know what to say or will say, you know, maybe I just knew or it was a little more intense than a dream or something. People who've actually had one will say, I can see why you would ask that question, but trust me, I've had a lot of dreams and I can tell the difference between being awake and having a dream. And this is so different and so more intense and so more real than even day-to-day life that it's impossible that it was a dream. They'll say something that has all these superlative comments in it, like it's more than or the most real or something like that. The other question that I ask them is how they know that the person that they saw at the entity on the other side was was God or or Jesus and or, or that it was their father. Like this guy, Ted, his father died when he was really young. So it had been a long time. How did you know for sure? And one of the interesting things, and, and this would be another element of near-death experiences, they say, oh, there is no question. When you're back on earth, the only way you can communicate is you listen to something or you read something. And, you know, there are exceptions to that, Braille and and so forth. But there is a great ability to misunderstand people. People intend to convey some meaning with words and somebody takes it differently or they didn't convey it well or both. And so misunderstandings here happen all the time. Every single person without exception who's had a near-death experience will say communication on the other side is more like thought to thought, communication, maybe mental telepathy or some other analogy, but it's unquestioning knowledge and it is perfect. And so there's no question. And so you say, how did you know it was God? There is absolutely no question in my mind because that's what he communicated to me. Or how do you know it was Jesus? It was him. I just I just know it. There is absolutely zero margin of error, that kind of thing. Especially at the beginning, I did most of the reaching out. Now, you know, some some of each. But I hear probably almost one a week, two or, two or three times a month on average of new experiences from people. And some I have cracked down or heard about. Some people just call up and say, you know, so-and-so said that you have this organization or you're involved with an organization. I like to hear a little bit about it and I don't know what to do. You know, I've had this near-death experience and my spouse thinks I'm crazy. Do you have any thoughts? And the calls are kind of interesting when they come my way and I'm not the one that's reached out. There are a vast variety of experiences. They're just, some of them are just a minute or two. I knew one guy who is a friend of mine and he had a medical problem. He had a brief heart attack and he sort of popped out of his body and looked down and then his heart started beating in and he was back. And it was less than a minute, probably less than 15 seconds. And so everything from something really short like that to something that would consist of several hours, one of the more lengthy ones that I interviewed was a man named George Ritchie, who wrote a fascinating book called Return from Tomorrow, who who was also a friend of Raymond Moody's. He he was an MD psychiatrist, so very, very bright man, Southern gentleman through and through. And his near-death experience happened because he was in the army at the time, and he had pneumonia in both lungs, and, and he died. They wheeled him off to the morgue, and he was there for who knows how long before he began to wake up. So sometimes the intervening time period is really long, 20 minutes underwater, like Crystal, the young girl who I was talking about at the beginning and from the swimming pool accident and George Ritchie, hours would be an incredible length of time. Pronounced dead and put a sheet over him and wheeled off to the morgue. The only absolutely sure 
element that I know of that's totally different about kids' near-death experiences is that adults usually, not always, but usually will have the life's review. I have yet to find a single child who was maybe under the age of, you know, seven or eight years old, somewhere in that range that had a life's review. And my presumption is kids are still kind of, you know, young and it is innocent and, and it might be unnecessary since they're coming back for one to happen. Or perhaps they aren't far enough along in their life to have a real moral grounding to understand some of the things that they might see. But that is a huge difference. As to the detail involved, my experience with children and near-death experiences is that they can describe exactly what happened to them in vivid detail. Just, you're right, it, exactly as, as you said, but they always have that experience in their mind the same way they did when they had it as a kid. So if you were to find somebody who was 93 that had a near-death experience when they were four, they would probably still remember it extremely vividly, but there would be no new you know, added details or insights that they had from the experience itself. It, it might be some new insights that they gained from the intervening years, but the experience itself will, will remain absolutely pure and described exactly as they first saw it. Maybe an example would be, I have yet to have somebody who I interviewed much later say, you know, and until now, I, I never remembered it, but there was this dream or something. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, or there was this building or, you know, some new element. They describe it exactly the way it was as a child, but yes, in vivid detail. First, I have interviewed some children who, who were fairly young. The, the little girl, Crystal, who died in the swimming pool in Pocatello, Idaho, that was actually kind of my tipping point to believing for sure that near-death experiences were real. Up until then, I was, shall I say, a hopeful skeptic. Um, and I interviewed a number of people and said, ah, oh, that's really cool. But maybe it was a hallucination that they thought was really real or something. And then I was able to assemble for one three-hour radio interview, the pediatrician, so the doctor who gave her the medical care from the pool on the way to the hospital and then took care of her afterwards, both of her parents and her brother. And afterwards, it occurred to me, no one would make this up. No one would come up with an elaborate story and put a little kid, by then she was I think six or seven, and, and this had happened just a year or two earlier, a little kid could not keep a story straight like that if they had made it up. They remember true things pretty well. It just struck me that this had to be real. And sort of the crux of the thing was that Crystal, during her near-death experience, acquired knowledge or information that she did not have before, and she could not have had any other way unless you want to come up with some conspiracy. And by that, I mean, when, so when she was in heaven, some of the additional details are that Jesus showed her her family and said, would you like to go back? And she said, no, I really, I really like it here. This is a great place. I want to stay here. And so he's showing her how sad her mother is and that she is making dinner and how sad her father is and that he's reading the paper and how her brother's really sad because he thinks that Sister Crystal's going to die. And these, these points were verified by the parents. And I suppose you could say, yeah, they lied and came up with the story, but why would they do that? That's what pushed them over the edge into believing it was really true as well. So Crystal was saying, yeah, my mom was making dinner while well, she was making soup. And she described how she made the soup, what she was doing, and the details about her dad reading the paper. And she saw this from the other side. She could never have had that information except by her spirit being outside of her body. Why? Because she was back in the hospital in a coma. Her physical body was. So... It's either a massive conspiracy between the whole family and the doctor, or it was a real event. So one of the things that I look for that I find fascinating, and, and there are several like this, is where people acquired knowledge or information that they just never had before. They could not have had it. It was impossible for them to know it. And it was 
verified by their people. Their spirit has left their body and they're going around. Little Crystal was with, she said, Jesus showed him around. And finally, you know, I guess Jesus is the great psychologist. And he says, would you like to stay here or go back? And she said, I want to stay here. Well, wouldn't you like to see your mom again? She said, yeah, I would like to see my mom again. And she was sent back. So, you know, ask the right questions of a little kid, get the right answer. But to get to your point about verifiable information, there's a book called Mind Sight, M-I-N-D-S-I-G-H-T. And it's about people, and these are quite rare, but they occasionally happen. These are people who have been blind for an extended period of time, and in a few cases, forever, for their whole life. And then during their near-death experience, they could see. And one of the most interesting of those, well, there are two that I'll mention. One was an elderly woman who came in with a heart attack to medical professor at the University of Virginia, Bruce Grayson, from whom I heard this story personally. And one of the patients in the hospital, this woman who was completely blind, had come in and had a heart attack. And to try to start her heart, they were using the paddles and the nurse was sent back to get some adrenaline into a needle so that they could inject it straight into her heart. And she couldn't get it out of the vial, so she just broke the vial. It was an emergency, so she just broke it. And she, you know, drew the drew the adrenaline out and it worked. They brought her back. But the woman said, and she was totally blind, and this happened in the back room. So she could not have seen it or heard of it. She said, young lady, that was a brave thing you did, but you shouldn't have done that. You could have cut yourself after she described seeing this this lady break the vial and pull the adrenaline in, into the into the syringe. Another one that's incredibly interesting was a lady who had been blind from birth. When her mother gave birth to her, they gave her too much oxygen. She It damaged her retina. She was blind from birth. And she, she never saw. And she was in a car accident and her spirit left her body and she was able to see. But she was really confused because she had not seen before. And she couldn't figure out what was going on and didn't know what sight really was. And she finally figured it out because she was standing in the air essentially above her body while they were working on her. And she was able to see visually what she had felt probably thousands of times on her left hand, which was her wedding ring. She was married and she knew what her wedding ring felt like. And she was able to see the pattern that she had felt many, many times. And she said, oh, this must be what it's like to see. And from there, she sort of clued in and figured things out. Kind of like the aha moment that Helen Keller had when she learned what water was for the first time. Kind of a touching story. But those kinds of things where people have knowledge about something they couldn't have done. How could Vicki Umapek, which was her name, how could she have possibly seen the things that she described in the operating room or the other things that were just beyond that, that she also saw she couldn't have. She was completely, totally blind. And maybe the most astounding one of all was would be the brain surgery of the country singer who was Pam, who had what's called a standstill surgery. And her spirit left her body. Her heart had been stopped for the surgery. Her respiration had been stopped. Her body temperature had been lowered to uh, 60 degrees so that her tissues, her body or physical body would not deteriorate. And they put some earbuds in her ears and waited till her brainwave stopped. So by every measure, every known measure, she was dead. No brainwaves, no hearing, no respiration, no heartbeat. She was out. And she was also covered except for her, the top of her head for the brain with an appropriate cloth for the surgery. And yet she was able to describe in quite vivid detail what had happened to her, which included how they sawed a hole in her head so that they could do the surgery. And she described in detail what the physical instrument looked like. And this was quite astounding to the surgeon who was 
kind of an atheist, maybe a strong agnostic might be a better way to say it, but the Pam Reynolds country singer, NDE, is, is one where she acquired information or knowledge she could not have had. Anyone can have a near-death experience. They don't just happen to Protestants or more likely to some group. They don't not happen to Muslims or atheists. I mean, they happen to everybody. You cannot find a demographic that does not have near-death experiences. And some of those dramatic, frankly, are people who were atheists until they had their near-death experience and obviously changed their mind. However, your question brings up a really fascinating point, which is that you always will interpret your near-death experience based on your own personal history and experiences. I mean, what else could you do? You know, you can't find somebody who's had an NDE who has no history. That'd be a newborn having an NDE and they would have nothing to say. Everyone has an experience and they all sort of use their own personal background to tend to describe it which is in some sense why I really enjoy and am persuaded by children who've had near-death experiences because they don't have so much culture or religious background. For instance, one little kid whose name was Eric, who I talked to said, oh no, I didn't die. Because the question was, did you die? And he said, oh no, that's when they put you in a box and bury you in the ground. No, I went up to heaven. It was really pretty. It was really nice there. You know, you'll see that kind of a thing. And so that's the kind of experience that, that you get in terms of description from children. They have the same experience, but they might use different terms. Little kids might say, I saw this beautiful person who was white and glowing and beautiful. And if you talk to someone who was older, or who maybe has, you know, Christian or even a Muslim background, they'll say, I saw an angel. They were bright and brilliant and white. And they'll describe it as an angel. A little kid might just say, beautiful, glowing white lady or something like that with blonde hair or whatever. But everybody has the same experience. Doesn't I've talked to people from Japan, spoken with a few Muslims from the Middle East who had them, and they will usually say they saw the angel Gabriel. They will not say they've seen God because the typical Islamic belief is that God is not seeable, but you can see God's messengers or angels. Typically, Jews and Christians will be approximately the same thing. I've talked to a number of atheists who, Eben Alexander is a great example of this. He, he was a neurosurgeon, taught at Harvard, trained at Duke, wrote a New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, which is quite fascinating, where he describes his transition through his own personal near-death experience from being an atheist to a believer in the other side and in the next life and deity. People like that change. He uses different terminology than a Christian would because he really never was a Christian prior to his NDE. So he would describe it from his own personal observations and medical background. Christian might use more Christian terminology. It's kind of fascinating. But interestingly enough, I don't know of any other figures who are described other than certain angels. People have said they saw the angel Gabriel and Jesus and God. Those are kind of the different categories of, shall we say, beings on the other side that are described by title or by name. I have spoken with people who had near-death experiences when they were very young, but I have never interviewed. There may be, I'm, I'm not saying this is impossible, I just haven't had this kind of an interview with somebody who, you know, died when they were six months old or, or something and come back. And later, after they were grown up, was able to tell what they saw. That has not personally been something I've had. Some of the more interesting ones, though, with the unborn, if you bring that up as, as a topic, is an acquaintance from the same neighborhood that I lived in had a couple living there, and the wife had just learned that she was expecting their first kid, so she was all excited. But before they told the rest of their family, I guess it was you know a few weeks later or something, they found out that her mother was dying. 
and it was everybody come quick mom's not going to make it and so everybody went and while they were around the hospital bed where mom was passing away she gave her last breath and died and people started to cry and they were hugging each other and a few minutes later all of a sudden mom woke up again and she said which of you girls are expecting and it was girls not which one of you is expecting and so two of them are friends from the neighborhood and her sister both just said well we are and grandma or mom or however you want to describe her said that she had just been on the other side and had been spending some time getting to know these two little girls who were just about to be born into the family and she described their personalities one was to have dark hair and one was going to be a blonde and one was outgoing and one was kind of shy and according to my friend from the neighborhood that her descriptions were, were accurate but after making that observation and saying something along the lines of i I wish I could be there to experience more of it or something. She died a second time and that was it. But she apparently saw children waiting to be born. And incidentally, I mentioned that before, but Katie or Crystal, the girl who in the book, she's called Katie, but her real name is Crystal, uh, the one that died in the swimming pool from drowning. And she spent some time on the other side in addition to with God and she played with a couple of little kids who were waiting to be born as well. So I guess that's the closest I have to somebody who had an NDE when they were little, not quite the same, but something close. Occasionally you will hear near-death experiences that talk about some future apocalypse or the world's going to be ruined or some horrendous thing. And I've interviewed a few people who have described things along those lines, you know, wars, invading armies in the United States, different kinds of things. And I will always ask them an additional question. Okay, well, were you told that that was absolutely inevitable? Or is that only one of a number of possible outcomes, depending on how society and, you know, people individually conduct their lives? And often they will think about it and say, no, I don't think anything in the future is absolutely set in concrete and immutable. We have free will. And if we all exercise our free will, you know, change for the better, the world will change for the better, kind of like that ripple description. And so most of the descriptions that I've heard about future calamities and destructions are, I would describe as contingent on whether or not society as a whole makes better choices or not. Actually, just a week ago, I heard a woman who had near-death experience in connection with having her twins born. This was her first, last, and only pregnancy, and she had twins. And she found herself on the other side with Jesus, and life was hard. She did not want to come back. And she was shown the trajectory of what would happen to her husband and her two girls and others who were friends, relatives, if she stayed on the other side. And then she was also shown different possibilities of what would happen if she came back. And all of those were possibilities. It was up to her, depending on what choice she wanted to exercise. And she decided to come back. And from that and some of these other descriptions, I have the sense that future events, although they may happen. I did know a woman named Elaine Durham who passed away in 2020 during COVID. And she saw back in the 1990s, some future calamities and was describing them to me as great monuments and buildings being destroyed in the United States. And I kind of scoffed at, at her a little bit and thought, well, you know, maybe, but I liked her and, and believed her. And I remember the morning the 9-11 happened, my phone rang and she said, this is it, this is it. Remember you wondered if I'd been, you know, telling you something that I really knew about? Well, this is it, this is it. And she saw the Twin Towers come down and she also saw some of the conflicts that happened. There was a time when a guy backed a truck up to the Washington Monument with a bunch of explosives in it. And, you know, recently a number of 
statues of notable people like Christopher Columbus and Robert E. Lee and, and Lincoln and others have been torn down. And whatever you think of them, those were the kinds of events that, that Elaine Durham saw and described in the future. And apparently, whatever contingencies would have been required to alter those didn't happen. And they really did come to pass. I remember she had described them, but of course, she couldn't describe it as 9-11 before 9-11 happened. One of the points that I'd like to make here, sort of to make these future potentially negative things in the future seem more positive, is that even people who have had near-death experiences that are negative, who have seen horrible things or who saw their life as being bad or going in a wrong direction, or people like Elaine Durham and some others have seen future calamities, all of those have been information imparted to them, apparently by God, so that they could make better decisions and direct their life in a better way and help others to do the same. And so, and analysis, I believe every near-death experience, whether it has a possible future calamity or some other dire thing in the future, it's ultimately for our good and to help direct us on a better path in life. Ultimately, if I've learned anything from near-death experiences is that they are real and they are here and now. And by the way, if you want to read an interesting book, read Carol Zaleski's Other World Journeys. It's out of print, but it has near-death experiences from centuries and centuries and centuries ago before the first you know, 1976 Raymond Moody book was out. So this shows that these aren't some brand new thing that's never happened before. They've always been happening, but they happen much more now because of modern science and medicine. And I believe one of the reasons that's true is so that people can see the other side and help direct the world in a more positive way with genuine love and helping others and to learn more knowledge. That's that's the crux of near-death experiences and why I'm fascinated with them and believe that they exist as a phenomenon that we're able to grasp and understand and incorporate into our lives to improve them.